Welcome, everybody, to episode 10 of Melbourne Calling. Um, why we're doing this episode? Well, it's definitely not to put me to sleep. It's not just about council issues, which I have to say, by the way, cover some of the most important things in our life. Developers fucking up our suburbs, um, you know, planning, um, community sports, doing something about the housing crisis, not to mention, you know, the, the bread and butter issues of whether your bins are picked up or your services are slashed. It's sort of, in my opinion, at least about the last shield, the last protection for young people, for working class people, for small businesses. Um, if you think about it historically, like nowadays, unions are basically wiped out or this week or I suppose with the exception of the construction unions. Most people aren't in unions. Um, nowadays, your federal or your state MP is almost certainly out of touch and in the pockets of some political master, be that liberal or labor, whatever. And in the past few months, especially on planning, the state government's gone even more with their arse in the air to the developers, at least in my opinion. Um, and I think it's councils, and in particular, community-focused council, councillors and community-centred councillors like you two, and hopefully myself, I'd argue, um, because a lot of councillors are actually time servers, are the only elected representatives that can help you stand up to dodgy developers, um, help local business and the poor during COVID, support public housing tenants when they need help. And I don't know about you two, but the public ring me about all types of stuff from illegal dumping in laneways to wanting a public housing transfer to help fighting an overtop development. Often it's a state issue, a federal issue. Sometimes it's even an international issue. And this is the playing field that punters can actually get hurt, make a difference, get a result. It's the area where the bad guys have the least influence. And um, it's a huge opportunity, in my opinion, for turning around politics in Australia. So tonight I've brought together in this episode 10, two people, two other councillors that I really, really respect and look up to and I've learned a lot from. Um, they're councillors in key areas of this city and they've shown through not just their words but more importantly their actions and their record and uh, what's possible when you marry community mobilisation with a staunch staunch attitude to the powers that be and, and brave leadership, which I think these two have shown over the years. So it's my great pleasure, first of all, to introduce um, and by the way, both of them are speaking in individual capacities. They're not here representing their council. They're not here representing anyone else on the council other than themselves. And I think you're going to get a lot out of listening to what they have to say, and hopefully also what I have to say, because unlike the other four, nine issues of Melbourne Calling, I'm actually throwing my two bobs in on, on, on the issues of the, of the night as well here today. So I think, um, uh, first up, Daria, you're... Well, if I'm not mistaken, you're the deputy mayor, not only a councillor in Hobson's Bay. Can you just briefly explain to people where Hobson's Bay is if they're looking at a map of Melbourne? So Hobson's Bay, for anyone who lives out east, is basically over the Westgate Bridge. Um, so once you get off the Westgate Bridge, you turn left, um, you're right in Spotswood. Um, Spotswood takes you into Newport through to Williamstown. Uh, from Williamstown, you can head towards, you know, Altona North, uh, Altona, Laverton, Altona Meadows, and Seabrook. So it's pretty so much. It's really uh, mixed. So you've, you've sort of like got the Fitzroy of the West in Williamstown and Yarra. Yeah. It's pretty pretty hipster sort of trendy nowadays. But you've also got a lot of very working class. So down Altona Way, it's very mixed, much more mixed than Yarra actually. Yeah, yeah. So so Williamstown's kind of like the we call it the the Turak of the Western suburbs. Um, so a lot of foreshore area. We've got uh, you know natural wetlands. Um, and then, yeah, Altona North starting to become a little bit more hipstery, I guess. Um, and, yeah, like you said, through to working class suburbs. Who would have believed that 20 years ago, Altona North? No, oh, you'd have absolutely, yeah, no, no way, no way. Very industrial back then. Um, and Gaetano, you're also the deputy mayor, if I'm not mistaken, in Darabin Council. You've been on the council. I forgot to say, Darry, you were elected last October. You're in your first term at the moment. Yeah, um, that's right. Gaetano, you, you've been in there longer than um, Kim Il Sung in North Korea, I think, in the city of Darabin. How long have you been on the council there? And can you just, for the listeners, because people watch this from all over the world, just explain if you're looking at a map of Melbourne, what type of suburbs and the demographic of your municipality? Yeah, and look, thanks, Stephen. First of all, I'd like to say, just to reinforce the point, I'm speaking here as an independent councillor. I'm not representing any of the council's views or anything like that. So just speaking my mind as an independent councillor. Yeah, look, I've been on council. This is my fourth term, so it's 13 years that I've been on the council. Uh, I'm deputy mayor, as as Daria is. Uh, I was once also a mayor back in 2014. And the area that, that Darabin represents, it's a bit of a mixed bag, as we've just said. Uh, we, we represent um, the North, West Garth, Thornbury, Preston areas, right up to 
then up to the reservoir areas and a little bit of a pocket of Bandura and also a little pocket of Alfington that, that we represent. So we often say there's the, um, the there's a Bow Street uh, border there between the, the north and south. Uh, north of Bow Street, you could say it's more sort of working class. And south of Bow Street is, um, again, like you said before, um, um, Stephen, it's um, you know more of a hipster, uh, very gentrified and things like that. I'm an old Northcote boy, grew up in, as I like to say, in the lanes of Northcote and as a little boy and, um, and, and lived here virtually nearly all my life. And how long have you been on the council in uh, at Darabin? 13 years. Right, okay. Oh, wow. This is the so, fourth time we've been elected. Yeah. Fourth, fourth term, yeah, okay. Um, and just for those who don't know, I'm you know, Steve Jolly. I'm not just the host of this um, YouTube channel, but also a city councillor in the city of Yarra, which is just immediately to the south of Darabin. In other words, it's the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne. So it's suburbs that everybody in Australia would have heard of, like Fitzroy, Collingwood, um, Richmond. But also um, uh, it's got side by side with a lot of hipster and sort of gentrification. You've got the largest percentage of public housing in Australia is in the city of Yarra, 10%. We've got 12 uh, high rise towers, 20 stories each. And the biggest public housing estate in the Southern Hemisphere is in North Richmond. So it's, 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 it's a sort of, a, it's quite an extreme mix, if you know what I mean. And um, I was elected or re-elected in October for a fifth term. But one of the points, Gary, I just want to start with you in terms mm -hmm. of the guts of this interview was um, in, 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 uh, in my intro, I was talking about the fact that often if you are a good councillor, if you actually genuinely want to represent the people that you who elected you, you can't just sometimes just strictly stick to, to municipal issues. So, for example, it's in, just watching you from afar, from the other side of Melbourne, with the COVID, the devastation it's caused here in, in Melbourne, in Australia, throughout the world, you've, um, you've raised COVID-related you know, issues on the council within the community, for example, about the difficulties migrant, a lot of migrant communities um, the idea, you know, the difficulty in, in jacking up vaccination rates amongst um, migrant communities, the, the need, in your words, for, for a roadmap out of um, uh, some hope, I guess, for small businesses and working people out of lockdown. And I was just wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit and also what type of response you've had from the community and from the other councillors on that matter. Okay, so about a week ago, I put up um, a, a motion through to council and the motion basically asked, um, for the mayor being the authorised spokesperson for council to write to the premier and ask him to urgently release a timetable um, that, that details the easing of restrictions on small business owners. And that was uh, noting that the, that the ongoing lockdowns um, were impacting businesses and that the damage that was being done was irreparable. Um, I had an overwhelming response through the community on basically putting that up on social media. I've had over eight, uh, 19,000 reach, 145 likes, and that's that's huge for a social media post. Um, you know, you're normally lucky to get, what, uh, 20 likes or something on a post, Stephen? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, at the same time, it was shared across Victoria 48 times, which is, you know, nothing that I've ever experienced before. Um, and But, yeah, at the same time, copped a bit of criticism for that so while businesses loved it local residents loved it um you know some people within the community accused me of politicking um which was kind of an interesting i guess criticism considering the fact that you know we have like a number of political parties who choose to run candidates and fund candidates throughout victoria to get into local council so one of the conversations i had with you in this matter is that you're talking about like a young muslim woman that you were talking about uh, you know, vaccinations and, and okay. some of the thoughts that and the doubts that she had, which I thought was really interesting and that some of the councillors, and we're not going to name names, so it's not a question of adding anyone, but some of your colleagues may be coming from a white middle class and an upper middle class background, might, wouldn't have a, a clue about what ordinary people um, think about and the fears and the need to, to, you know, patiently go through these issues and concerns that people have. You can't bully people in to doing something that they may start with not want to do. Yeah, so we've got a very, I guess, like culturally and linguistically diverse community um, who live in Hobson's Bay. Um, so, you know, throughout Altona North, Brooklyn um, suburbs. And I think, you know, you've seen Premier Dan Andrews on TV calling out Altona North as being a hotspot and sort of suggesting that men in their 20s and 30s need to go out and get tested. 
Um, and I mean, you know, we've all got our different opinions when it comes to, to vaccination, whether it's, you know, a, a cultural thing or whether it's just something that you, you don't want to do. But I kind of believe that you've got to put yourself in into those people's shoes and try to understand, I guess, where they're coming from. And, you know, if you, if you don't necessarily speak English as a first language, you don't need a tall white guy telling you that you need to get vaccinated. You need to get somebody, I guess, who speaks your language, who lives the life that you do um, to explain to you, I guess, you know, the benefits of, of vaccination. And, you know, I've, even though this might be boring to the viewers, the, um, the, the council officers, I think, have done a really, really good job in addressing these issues right now. Gaetano, just with you with the Preston market, technically speaking, it's obviously a little bit of a Preston uh, Darabin Council issue, but it's also to a large degree a state government issue. And I was just wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what it seems to me as an outsider is the biggest issue that's going on in Darabin at the moment, the protection of that um, market in Preston. Yeah, no, you're spot on. Look, um, Preston market um, it is a big issue for our community uh, because it's, it's one of the um, icons of our city. When you think of Preston, what, you know, what else is Preston known for? It's known for its Preston market. And uh, what the state government did that did something really, um, really sneaky on us is that they became the responsible authority over Preston market. So they've taken it in under their wing and now they're making all the decisions about, you know, what sort of planning controls are going to be associated with Preston market. So they've really usurped the, the role of council in this whole process. And, and that's a real shame. Look, the, the community's really um, been fighting on this, you know, but we've been fighting on this for the last five or six years. It's come to the really sticky end now um, because the, um, the, the, the VPA, the Victorian Planning Authority, which has been instructed by the minister to develop a planning controls for the site. And the planning controls that they came up with, notwithstanding all the consultation, and I've said this publicly in the chamber, that the consultations by the Victorian government were a complete sham. They actually hired. They actually hired. Surprise! Surprise! Yeah, that and and they specifically I won't name them, but but the consultants that were involved were just a complete sham. And because I participated in the in in the thing, and the way that the consultation was orchestrated to deliver a certain outcome about oh it's okay to move the market, it's not a problem if we move the market, and um, and 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 at the consultations you had trade trader representatives there. You had organisations representing um, large groups of community members, and then you just had people off the street. And what they did in the in the community consultation, where they gave a vote each to all the participants, not with notwithstanding who you represented. And so some of them had some students that they just dragged off the street and said, "What's your view?" And it was, you know, so it was a complete sham. And where we're at now is that the Victorian Planning Authority has come up with a with a plan. And it's an atrocious plan, which means that 80% of the market will be um, demolished. It will mean there'll be 2,200 dwellings built on that site, which is a complete overdevelopment. Actually, fortunately, our officers have done some studies where they've said that the concentration of people, the density around the Preston market, if this proposal goes through, is more than what happened at Fisherman's Bend. That's how bad it is. That's how shocking it is. And, um, and so there's an action group that's been organised by the community and they really want to take it up to the local decision makers who are, many of them are the ALP, um, um, MPs of the area, and also the State Minister for Planning, Richard Wynne. We feel that the, uh, that the state government and the MPs, as far as we've heard from them now, they've all been fairly silent on this. They're just waiting to see how how much of this is going to be a political issue because none of them, I haven't seen not one of them actually step out and say, no, we need to keep the market where it is and we need to tell the state government to go and piss off and, and get out of the way of all this. So, so I guess with the federal and state elections coming up, um, it's a question of wedging the Labor Party and making it that they, they'll lose those federal and state seats that cover the Preston area if they don't um, do the right thing and get you know sit down with the community and the council and work out some uh, arrangement, that, uh, some plan for the market that the residents and the and the traders are happy with. I mean, is that uh, like I suppose the closer we get to the state and federal election, it increases your bargaining power, I guess. Would it you does. agree with that? Oh, look, it does definitely, and that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting to see how much community upheaval there'll be, and and then sitting in there. From what I see, is that they're looking at how can we manage the community in this. 
unfortunately, the community action group that's been established um, uh, has come up with a proposal saying that we want to publicly have public acquisition of the market site. There's no other solution, really. If you think of um, that the market is in private hands and the only way to have the to save the market in the long run, planning alone will not save the market. What needs to be done, like the other markets that we have in the city of Melbourne, the ones that are left, if you think of Victoria Market, if you think of the Dandenong Market, if you think of the Paran Market, uh, why they've survived so long is that because they are publicly owned. So the community is also trying to mount a case to say, uh, why don't we look at public acquisition? Why? Because uh, public acquisition works on the principle of... Hey, Tano, you've, your audio just cut out there. Oh, I'm just saying, yeah, sorry about that. My computer's got all these little uh, uh, things associated with it. You're the deputy <laughs> mayor of Darwin, mate. You should have the world's first practice computer. <laughs> There's no perks in that job. <laughs> no perks at all. But so what I was saying is that so the community is fighting for public acquisition because they're saying that's the only way that we can safeguard the market into the future. And there can be a case for it. The community wants to bring the case up to the to the MPs and to the Minister for Planning to say that the only solution is is public acquisition. And that public acquisition should be a course of action that should be explored and a case be made for that. That's really radical, actually. I mean, basically, it's almost like the nationalisation or the, you know, well, it is public acquisition of what's now private land. But, no, but, but, but after Stephen, what's COVID... Wrong with that? But Stephen, what's wrong with that? No, so, that's fantastic. But Stephen, what I'm trying I've to say spoken, is... If, if, yeah, no, I know that. I know, but just to make this point, I've spoken to many of the traders, and these are business people, small business people, and a lot of them are... You know, they run businesses, you know, so they're business focused. But when you say to them public acquisition, they don't shy with that thing. Many of them have said to me personally, hey, you're absolutely right. That's the way we should be going. Mm. And it really shows how, the, you know, people's consciousness has, de has developed a lot in Australia over the last few years. Um, and I think even with COVID, it shows the importance of government, of the state, you know, um, whether you like what the government's doing or not. The government's much more powerful now in Victoria, in Australia, New South Wales, through COVID than it used to be. And so the ideas that you're raising and the community you're raising now don't seem so like crazy ultra left as they might have seemed three years ago. People like you and I have been banging on about this for a million years. Like, don't you know, we're the dinosaurs, but now everyone else is up for it. So I think it's great. It's really, but like with planning, um, Daria, I suppose it's, I remember years ago, just when I got elected in 04, this Labour Party councillor, who's now an organiser in the CFMU, Steve Roach, he was a Labour Party councillor in Moreland, and he said to me, your most power will be on planning. 80% of what you do, 80% of your power for council will be on planning. And I just wonder, you know, you've been now, you're coming up to a year on the council. Um, how do you think, you know, the planning system works, especially from the point of view of, say, a resident who's like, maybe somebody wants to put five storeys next to their house or whatever it might be. I mean... You know, I know I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm just curious because you're coming fresh to this, not unlike the town and myself. What, what, what's your feeling of how the planning system at a council level works in Victoria? I, I, so from, I, I haven't had that much experience to be quite honest. We haven't had any big, big ticket items come through us just yet, like you guys have. But I think the view from residents is that pretty much the developers get to do what they want. Um, you know, they submit their applications, whether council reject it, whether it goes through a Department of um, Planning Committee type meeting and councillors reject it. They're the guys with the money who can apply to VCAT and just get, seem to get everything overruled anyway. Oh, you've so, it's, it's something that they, they might think, you know, oh, it's great. Our councillors have, have, have listened to us and they've rejected this massive overdevelopment in this small little property. Um, but it, it goes through uh, straight through to VCAT and, you know, the developer wins anyway. So it's, it Tano, also I think seems utile to me. Darius probably put that a lot more succinctly than you and I would have done. Um, oh, okay. and, uh, no, and that's really I'm, good. That's, that's I, a I'd like to remind people again that these are my views and not the views of council. I look spot on, and if I could just say that. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, what, you know, what, what, do, do you want to, do you want to give your your take on it as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, um, the planning stuff over the years, and uh, and and what I've realised that over it is that when we deal with the planning applications, we're right at the end of the process. Mm. You, know, it's, uh -huh. it, you know, it's like, um, you know, the race has already been run in a sense. And, um, and something that I've been 
uh, advocating for a while now is that I ask myself this question. Why isn't there the same amount of development occurring in the eastern suburbs, the leafy suburbs, and rather than in the west and in the northern suburbs? And the, and the answer that I come down to is that if you look at our, if you look at the planning schemes of the northern suburbs, that that's the rules that we have to operate under. Ours, you could drive a truck through them. A lot, a lot of our planning schemes, you drive a truck through them. I mean, you, tell, you us, can, tell us what you really think. <laughs> yeah, literally, you could just bulldoze through them and build what you want. You know, but when you look at the eastern suburbs and you look at their planning controls and what the ministers allowed and permitted them to have as planning controls are far more stringent than what ours are. And, and that's what I think there's an inequity there and there's a class inequity there is that if you go to eastern suburbs, you know, you drive around, the, those places have hardly ever changed. If, if you come to the northern suburbs, people say, that, you know, if, if you shut your eyes for 15 years and you, and you woke up again, the whole place has completely, completely been transformed. Streets yeah. have been transformed. That's because our, our planning schemes uh, are not as tight as they are. And I'll just say this other point. When Matthew Guy, now that he's back in back in the scene, when he was planning minister, he did a really deceitful uh, exercise where he introduced the neighbourhood zones. Now, for example, in the eastern suburbs, the leafy suburbs, they locked up a lot of their areas as neighbourhood zones where you can hardly, you know, you only can have dual occupancies at the most. Instead of the northern suburbs, like in our suburbs and stuff, like um, when when that rezoning happened, we we are only allowed to. Um, lock up, if you like, to, to protect against development, only up to about 11% as neighbourhood zones, which means that we're open slather for developers relative um, to other parts of and more leafier suburbs of, of Melbourne. But yeah, see, um, can I, can ahead, I add something to that, though? But see... <laughs> I'm going to like flip things around to the the um, opposite view now and sort of say, you know, we've got a number of residents who are putting in applications for things like, you know, a basic driveway. And then certain suburbs like Williamstown and parts of Newport have got all these heritage overlays and people aren't even allowed to build driveways in these, like, these areas. And, you know, there's obviously a future push as well to get to convert vehicles into um, electric vehicles and increase uptake of that. Where the hell are these people meant to plug and charge their cars? without an access to a driveway. So it's sort of like, you know, you've got two sort of policies that don't really work well together. But I think it's also like a guilty conscience. Like for example, with VCAT, VCAT always go along with the big developers. They're a boss's court, they're unelected. However, to make themselves look good, sometimes for the smaller issues, mm -hmm. they'll be a little bit militant and they'll they'll start say, oh no, no, you, you, you know, well, they'll go with the resident. And it's the same with heritage, the double standards. The heritage laws are routinely ignored by every big developer in town. If you're lucky, you get facadism. Go to the Irish mm -hmm. Celtic Club in the city. I worked on it. I'll probably just get blacklisted after saying this, but they kept the, <laughs> the, the wall on the outside and they've gone up 70 stories. It's unbelievably ugly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and heritage is just routinely ignored in the city of Melbourne and often in the city of Yarra too. But if you're just a mum and dad with, with a house, say, on Burnley Street in Richmond, and you happen to have some heritage shed that there hasn't been a horse in for 120 years, they'll bust your balls, man. They will yeah. get all, oh, heritage, heritage, heritage. So so there's nothing wrong with it. It's true. You know, the heritage laws are implemented religiously against your average mum and dad, yeah. so to speak. But often with big developers, they can just, they get, they've got an army of, of planning experts to get around those laws. Um, but like, I think that like, from my perspective in Yarra, because the residents are really, really well organized and the planning minister's a local MP, so we can wedge him if, we're well, if, we're, if we push back, that there has been some wins, but it's only been when the residents have really mobilized and the powers of be have thought, fuck, we're going to lose votes um, if we don't give in. So like on Queen's Parade in, um, in Clifton Hill in North Fitzroy, um, they had a huge win up there where they pushed the development back 10 meters from the, uh, from the, the Heritage Shopping Strip and saved that shopping strip from being heritage shopping strip from being demolished, or the resident push back four years ago meant that at the gas and fuel site, it's a state government job in um, in Collingwood, the, the, to, to ensure that he kept his seat, they brought in 20% low cost housing, the, the highest percentage in that I'm aware of in Australia, uh, a six court indoor sports center and a new school embedded in a private development on wow. state government land. These were wins that were won. And I just think that, um, you know, um, it really sort of 
another, another point that, that, you know, that Gitana was making, which sort of triggered something for me, um, and I'm agreeing with him here, is that like often when you push back against a developer, you get accused, and Gitana would have got this copted, and it's definitely residents in, in Darabin would have copted, of being called a NIMBY, you know? And basically, um, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually unscientific because the population of where I live in Yarra has doubled since I first got elected. There's more cranes in Collingwood and Cremorne than you can poke a stick at. If you were in NIMBY, you wouldn't live there. You know, there's heaps of black people, Asian people. There's five times the average number of gay people. There's cranes. The place is bohemian mixed. It's massively expanding. No one is a NIMBY there. What we're saying in Yarra and what people like me are saying is that if you're going to build a high-rise building, make sure a percentage of it is, has got low-cost housing, what they call inclusion rezoning. That's law overseas in some countries. They, the Labour government are too scared to bring it in in, in, uh, in, in Victoria. If yeah. you're going to have, um, if you're going to build a high-rise tower, it has to be carbon-neutral energy. We got told in Yarra, and I bet you a million dollars it's the same in Darabin and Opsons Bay, City of Melbourne, that over 80% of emissions, carbon emissions, come from stationary energy, the powering of our offices and homes with carbon uh, fuel, uh, fueled um, energy. If we ban that, the, 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 uh, and, and had all carbon neutral energy in all new, not for mum and dad who wants an extra bedroom at the back garden area, but like the big developments, you know, <laughs> then you would, you would have a situation where emissions would just absolutely go down, you know, uh, to, to, to next to nothing. But I think, um, so I, I just think that planning is just like a really, really interesting thing. We, you're right, Gaetano, we can't stop it because they always win. Like even with Tim Gurner, when he lost at VCAT, he went to the Supreme Court. But what we can do is we can slow them down. And that really loses them millions, millions of dollars. So if we set the rules right, and we have this sort, you know, sort of Damocles over the head where we can slow down the developer. Two years onto a development, there's a lot of money lost for that developer. We can actually negotiate some really good um, solutions. And I think that it's easy to bang on about the defeats. And we've had a lot of losses. Mainly we, 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 we lose. But we have had some wins. And I think it's when the community have fired up and um, and put those type of ideas, especially at least that's what's happened in Yarra, you know. Um, but um, I mean, what, what, what would, how would you, uh, Gaetano, like to see planning run if you were the planning minister here in Victoria? Before I say that, Steve, I just want to, I want to make a point about the heritage because I think it's a point that often gets overlooked. Uh, in terms of heritage, there, is, there are systemic problems with heritage. And, and I've realised this through the Preston Market story. I see with Preston Market, we try to get Preston Market heritage listed, right? And, and it was refused to say that it's not of state significance, but it is of local significance. And what we learned out of that exercise is that notwithstanding that the market's been there 50 years, notwithstanding that it has certain architectural qualities about it and uh, from its, you know, from, from the building form, the space roof that it's, uh, the space frame roof that it's got and all these other things, but also the intangible, um, um, the, the intangible heritage that it has. It's a market that is seeing 50 years of waves and waves and waves of migration. It's a market that represents working class culture. But when, when you face that up to heritage rules and heritage laws, that doesn't get a Guernsey. Mm. Instead, if, if you're, if you're going to put up to a case for heritage, say, um, a Queen Anne style building or an Edwardian style building, that that flies through the you know flies through the heritage heritage rules. But 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 if it's associated with um, um, with um, um, uh, with with, the, with our multicultural community and what's important to them, and and not only what's important to them but their contribution um, to Australia, that does not get a Guernsey. And and I think that the what the Preston Market has, has actually unveiled that, that issue there because no one is looking at Preston Market as being a place of significance, not only to the, to the locals, but also to, um, to, to our multicultural communities in, in, in Melbourne and, and broader. So that's an issue that needs to be uh, addressed. And, uh, and, uh, and it's an issue I know that the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria are very concerned about because as we move more and more since the post-war migration, where are the places of migrants that get heritage markings or listings? Hardly any. Very few. Yeah, I hadn't actually thought of that. It's really interesting point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've noticed that. You know, particularly the. I mean, you asked the question about you know, if we were a minister of, of planning, what we would do. Um, 
look, I understand the role of the state and I understand the role of council in, in planning. I think the state has to have some sort of role in terms of the framework, setting the scene and things like that. But I think that I think the tendency that we're going down now where we're centralising more and more power to the state, I think that's wrong. And why it's wrong is that if you live in a place, you want to have some influence, some control, if you like, or through your representatives about what that place should look like. If, if you start from that premise, that means that more power should be given to councils within our overall framework of determining what sort of uh, planning regulations and rules should be in place. And I'll, just, and I'll just note one. For example, if you look at our planning rules, and there's something, again, I've noticed this particularly through festival. You know, when we talk about heights, you know, we, we had these planning controls saying that you couldn't build more than 10 stories. What happens? The developer comes up with a proposal for 14 stories. Oh, wow. We knock it back as a council. Then it goes to VCAT, arguments, barristers, lawyers, and things like that. It's accepted. So, so what that means is that, you know, when we say something, you know, do we really mean it? You know, and, and I think council you should use tighter language, you know, more mandatory type language so that so that it's both clear to the community, but also more importantly, it's clear to the developers so that they know what what they can get away with and not play the system and push it out to uh, an outcome, which which then when you look at your planning control, say, but I thought you only could build 10 stories there. How come they got away with 40 stories? It just discredits the whole process and the whole system. We don't do it with parking fines. We don't have a preferred parking fine, but uh, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to planning, we seem to be, and I know at Yarra, and I'm, you know, I'm not having a crack at the planning department at Yarra or anyone else, but I have to say there's times when the advice that we get is that we can just ignore uh, preferred height limits, even when there's a design and development overlay, which is one of the strongest planning instruments you can get. Um, but Daria, just, I wanted to ask you a question about the huge win that you've had and the community you've had with the bin, the bins mm -hmm. earlier um, this year, soon after you were elected. Um, but it also, it's sort of like, it's a bigger issue as well, um, Gaetano, because when people like me and Gaetano were kids, when we got involved in politics, there was unions, there was political parties and thousands and thousands of people were in the Liberal Party or the Labour Party or even the Communist Party um, and unions and, Nowadays, all of that's sort of gone, and now politics is all about social media and the politics, if you like, of um, observation and commentary. You know, mm -hmm. people getting their dopamine fix off Twitter takedowns and, and shit posting and so on. So old school campaigns on the ground um, are, are rare, but when they win, I just reckon it's just so good, and we really need to highlight that because that's real politics. It's not just talking shit on the on Twitter at ten o'clock at night in between, you know, jerking off to you porn or whatever, and then having a bloody glass of whiskey. So, you guys did something that we failed to do in Yarrow, which was you you had the bins gone from fortnightly, uh, from weekly to fortnightly. You got elected, as did a couple of other people, saying you were going to fight it, and you didn't sell out. You stuck mm -hmm. by your promise. But can you just talk us through that, like how you won that campaign um, and what the story is now? So for us to win a campaign like that, I think you've got to look back at what the history actually was. So the history, you know, as a resident, I had to do a little bit of digging to sort of understand what was going on as well. So back in, I think, April 2019, basically, they, uh, the, the former council at that stage, so like you said, I'm, I'm kind of a newbie who started in November last year. Um, well, not November. When was it? When were, when were, when was October. the last election? October. October. Okay. Well, October was kind of a blur. So <laughs> really November. But um, if you go back to April, the former council put in place like this, they ran this like waste and litter management strategy, which looked at what, what, what the future was going to hold. And they did a, a bit of a um, community consultation, survey, feedback kind of session at the time. Um, and they asked about what something would look like if, um, if they wanted to change like the future direction of the bins. So what would that look like? Um, and what were the, what, how did residents feel about, you know, potential changes to frequency of collection and implementing a four bin, four bin system, which included FOGO. And the feedback then actually said that only 7% of residents supported flipping, um, introducing a FOGO bin system 
um, that allowed garbage to be collected fortnightly and FOGO to be collected weekly. Only 7% of the community at that stage in April 2019 said that they supported that. Um, by about October 2019, um, council basically put, put a motion into place that said they were going to implement that anyway. Um, by December 2019, council moved a motion to say the, that that was going to be implemented by February 2020. In February 2020, the four bin system was rolled out. Our garbage um, moved from weekly garbage collection to fortnightly, and we received a FOGO and a glass bin as part of that. Um, there was really no consultation, um, no engagement, no real community, I guess, feedback in the process. Um, and as a result of that, you could imagine people were really, really pissed off. So I think what helped drive the campaign was that people were angry. Um, and that anger, even though it was implemented in February 2020, it, it, it had, still hasn't ended. So I mean, even, even today, I've been tagged in social media saying, hey, I know that you've managed to get weekly garbage reinstated, but when's it actually going to start? And is council true to their word or are we going to be receiving another rescission motion going forward? But it's it's sort of like, you know, you've been very modest there. I mean, you did get the win and mm -hmm. it will happen. I mean, obviously, it will happen. We, yeah, yeah, it will you know, happen. It's good that the punters are putting pressure on that they want it sooner rather than later. But it's not every day you get articles in the Herald Sun about a community win led mm -hmm. by a first term councillor. And I just think, and I'm not like pissing in your pocket, but it just shows that what is possible. Um, and, and I just think that that wins when we get them need to be celebrated and highlighted and uh, look it's, it's it's definitely not easy and i mean one councillor can't do it by themselves so you know it was i never committed to you know giving people a big bin upsize contrary to some people's beliefs i never ran a campaign saying i was going to reinstate weekly garbage collection i just simply said i want to hear what what the people want i mean if people are happy with it being collected fortnightly then that's great we'll leave it as as it is but if they want weekly then that's what i'm gonna fight for um, and, you know, we asked, it was me and a couple of other councillors asked, um, you know, council officers to give us some information. You know, have they actually asked for feedback? Tell us a little bit about what happened in history. And, you know, I, I felt that resistance um, from, from officers. That was my personal experience. I just felt that they didn't want to provide those answers or I'd ask for a specific number and I'd get like a page of text, which kind of just, you know, went around the issue um, and talked around the issue. Um, but we kept pushing. Um, you know, eventually me with a, a couple of other councillors basically said, let's, let's get a motion into, into chambers and push the officers to, to put out a, a survey to every single household and ask people to give us their feedback. What is it that they actually want? Um, and, you know, I worked on, a, on writing that motion with the Labor councillor um, and he put that up and I had to fight. I had to fight another councillor to, to try to second it and, you know, she beat me to it. So, but I mean, the outcome, the outcome was there. The feedback, the, the survey went out to every single house. We got the results in and I think, I believe that they spoke for themselves. But, but I think that a lot of councillors, I don't know what Gaetano's experience is, just do what the officers tell them to do, the senior yeah. officers tell them. So the very fact that you said that they gave you all this bump, which is to try and distract you from the, you know, it's all very much more complicated, Daria, than you could possibly imagine as a first-term councillor. We love your enthusiasm, but you have to be realistic. You know, all that sort of nonsense. A lot of people swallow that. A lot of councillors swallow that yeah, and sell out the, the people that put them in. And you stood strong. And I just think that maybe, maybe like uh, the fact that you've got, you know, you're, you're back in as a chartered accountant from the private sector, you're probably... Like working with a council, it's not like it's like going down in a sense in terms of the mm. dollars and cents. You weren't intimidated, as you shouldn't be, by you know senior officers. You work with them, you respect them, but you don't let them bully you either. And I think no, that's really important. It's, and it's hard. So I mean, getting elected, it was it was a shock. I mean, you know, the first thing the first thing that you do, you attend this swearing sort of ceremony. There's cameras there. There's media crew. Um, everybody's all, you know, dolled up and looking great. And you just sort of turn up thinking, oh, like, shit, what the hell's, <laughs> what the hell is going on? Your face is going to be on social media. Your face is going to be in newspapers. And I was, I was definitely, you know, a bit scared of that. And then, yeah, you're attending sessions and, you know, they, they expect you to go to weekend getaways to, to build, you know, trust and, and friendships with the officers and other counsellors and, they promote ideas that, you know, you all, you all need to become 
friends, you all need to work together. But the reality is that that's not necessarily always going to happen. You know, the first time that you end up butting heads with another counsellor or the first time that you end up butting heads with the officers, um, you end up realising, like, this, this is it. And you either, you either fold or you stand up for, your, for what you believe in. And, yeah, I chose to stand up and, and stay true to myself. And, and it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. I mean, even, even in this process, there's obviously a, a, a community group who didn't like it at all. And they were criticising us on social media. They were trolling my accounts. They were spamming my Facebook page with criticism. Who didn't like their return to Weekly. Who wanted to keep it Yeah, quiet. so, you know, I was like the, the garbage Nazi. You know, I wanted to pollute the whole world. I just wanted to create all this extra landfill. Like, that's the type of stuff that I was getting. Um, it was unbelievable. You know, the night that a group of councillors decided to put up a rescission motion. We had security called into, into council. We, were, we had police officers there. We were told to access the building through, you know, the CEO's entrance so that we could be escorted in safely because there were going to be protesters there. I mean, it was, it was scary, definitely scary. So, you know, at times like that, you, you either fold or you stand up for what you truly believe in and... The vast okay. majority of the public were on your side. The vast majority of the public expect weekly. The irony yeah. of it is, is that some, some people coming from a env pro-environment stance think going to fortnightly is better. But what I know in Yarra, the experience of speed mm. is that people can't, the bin's not enough every fortnight for all of your recycling, especially at Christmas time and birthday time, you've got kids and so on. So they just put their recycling, it's either out on the street or yeah. put into the normal, normal bin. So it actually increases landfill. So exactly, it's actually bad exactly. for the environment and what you've exactly. done is good for the environment, you know. But Yeah, uh, I mean, look, you know, council promote the fact that they've reduced landfill volumes by 30, 30 or 33%, something like that. But when you look at the reality, we never had green FOGO bins before. You know, that was an opt-in. So, of course, if you're giving people a green FOGO bin, that instantly reduces a certain amount of landfill. But what it doesn't count in the residential stream is landfill that's been dumped landfill that's thrown into park bins, um, the landfill that's that's thrown into your recycling bin. I mean, we had recycling truckloads being diverted straight to landfill. They weren't even getting sorted. So truckloads from, um, you know, suburbs like Altona North, Altona Meadows and Laverton weren't being sorted. They were just being picked up and taken directly to the tip. And the only reason I was able to get that information out there was because a resident happened to be at the tip at the time that a Hobson's Bay truck turned up and started dumping recyclables. And, you know, I got my hands on that photo and I, I sent it straight through to the officers and said, you know, explain what the hell's going on here. Um, and that put the pressure on them. And then I asked that question in chambers, which they obviously didn't like. And they had to admit it. And, I mean, no one wants to admit a failure like that. It's, it's no, Great work. Um, honestly, oh. it wouldn't happen without you. Obviously, it wouldn't have happened without the community uh, mobilization but it needed leadership as well um Gaetano just on what Daria was saying of the balance between working professionally you know with the CEO and the officers but not being a stoo stooge either um how have you you know uh navigated that sort of dilemma um over the years just on that but I think it's a really key point there uh look undoubtedly you know um you have to deal with officers in a professional manner. It's a workplace, you know? you know, you can't be abusive, you know, but that doesn't prohibit having differing views or mm -hmm. having a robust, you know, exchange, you know, because, and, uh, and one of the things I think that's important to remember as a counsellor, and, and also I think officers have to respect and acknowledge this, is that uh, we're not a board. I keep saying this to counsellors, we're not a board. We are a council. That means that we are elected representatives from the community. Mm -hmm. So we can't function like a board where it's a closed shop type of thinking and where you, where you only think about the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the organisation. Of course, you've got, you, you, you've got to look after the council and things like that. But at the same time, because you're elected, you're a representative of the people that have elected you. Mm -hmm. So you're undoubtedly going to come into conflict with some of the existing policies of councils, some of the views that, um, that, that, or the recommendations that come from officers. And we have to accept that. That's a natural um, state of play. Now, as long as that's done respectfully, you know, and 
you know, have a robust discussion and things like that. But it doesn't mean that because somebody is telling me that this is the way it should be done, that I, I just sort of have to accept it. No, I have to represent people. Mm. And I've, I've got to clap to that. <laughs> yeah, and if we can't convince people, like we had a similar situation to yours, uh, Nadia, in relation to parking, where in Darabin Council though, there was a proposal to actually have like almost like a blanket type of um, um, permit parking situation. When people found out about that, right, they were up in arms. And, and, and we're not talking about, you know, the, the, you know, the usual sort of, you know, redneck types. The community, you know, the broad community was up in arms about that. So I said, how can you do this? How you're not, you're not properly consulting with us, you know, and, you know, we haven't heard convincing arguments about this. Are you listening to us? And I remember at the time I had to put a, I had to put a motion into council withdrawing the whole proposal. So I said, guys, we need to ditch this because it, it it's obviously, um, notwithstanding the intentions of it, right? But if you can't bring the community with you, well, guys, you, we're, we're not doing our homework. We're not doing our work in, in relation to that because, because we, you cannot be elitist and impose decisions over people. Mm -hmm. You have to involve people in the process. And, and, if, and if you're not able to convince people, well, that's not a, a reflection on the people, that maybe it's a reflection on us that we're not doing our work well enough to actually make people understand and see the merits and the pros and cons of particular policy positions. I think it's really interesting that if you were, if either of us three were elected to state parliament or federal parliament, no one would bat an eyelid by saying, well, you know, Daria, we'll just say is a member of the uh, Hobson's Bay political party in the national party parliament of Australia. You know, you wouldn't get blamed for anything that Scott Morrison did, or if Albo was the prime minister, you wouldn't be blamed because they would go, well, they're the governing party and you're a one person party. Um, you're in opposition. You sit on the cross benches. Um, and there's a majority and a, and a minority in, in my council at the moment, for the first time since I've been on the council, there is a clear majority for the Greens. And I have um, some things we agree on and some things we definitely don't agree on. It's a clear majority minority, but it's very, very hard for, for some people at least to get their head around that. They go, why can't you all work together? No one expects Adam Bant to be going on holiday retreats with Scott Morrison or Albo yeah. because he's leader of a, of, a, of a totally different political party with a totally different you know, policy framework. So I don't know why people think the same should happen on council because it's not one big happy family. I mean, it'd be nice if it was, but it's not. Some people want bins fortnightly. Some people want bins um, weekly. Some people want to stick their... You know, just go along with anything the developer says, and some people want to stand up for the developers, depending on the issue. So, um, but um, my question, Gaetano, one of the things I think one of the things that in leadership is to have a little bit of a little a good strategic brain and a bit of a bit of um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of. But when it came to the NDIS, um, mass privatization of social services of aged care and so on. It was sold by the Labour government, it's a great thing, but it's the biggest privatization we've ever seen. Um, and what you, what you tried to do at, at Darabin was really smart. You said, well, why don't the council just register as an NDIS provider and get around it? And it sort of reminded me about when enterprise bargaining agreements were first brought in to the workplace and some of the more militant unions in the 90s said, okay, well, we can't change the federal law, but we'll just put the same wage claim to every single company. So we have collective bargaining and it was a very smart way of getting around EBAs. Um, and we still do it today, to this day in the building industry. So what you tried to do there, um, I thought that was really, really smart. I mean, can you just explain like why you had a problem with NDIS and why you think the council should register and how that would be better for the community? Yeah, look, I'm glad that you brought that up. We had a big uh, battle uh, on council and particularly um, with the Greens and, and, and some other councillors. So, because what was happening in aged care, as you pointed out, was that um, with the changes that were introduced, lo and behold, by um, the Labor government um, back in, in 2013, was a gradual privatisation of aged care. And what that, meant, what that meant for councils is that at the moment, councils received bulk funding from, from federal government in relation to running aged care services. But what they, what they are doing now is that they've, they've um, created a system which is called the aged care package system, which means that councils will be weed off, this was the plan, to be weed off 
the bulk funding. And then as a result of that, there will be no more bulk funding. You know, this was the original plan. And then everyone will get their aged care services through private providers or, or not-for-profit providers. And so um, that left council sort of in a bind. And many councils went through this or are still going through this saying, okay, now that the funding may dry up for councils, that we're not going to get bulk funding, this is our opportunity to opt out of aged care. Some councils took that step. They said, let's just wash our hands of aged care because now, now it's the uh, private sector, loopers and loopers and all these other companies now can look after the aid. And, um, and then we had a Royal Commission to tell us, which was pretty obvious. You know, you, all you have to do is just go and talk to some aged care recipients uh, how bad the system was, you know, that they were getting from, um, from private providers. Very, very few people complained about about council services. So what we did in what were the argument that I was presenting in in, in Darab, not just me, but there was a whole community action group of elderly people in their seventies and eighties saying council must become an aged care provider. So the logic that we pursued this was that okay, we we had a battle with the federal government in advocacy about trying to change this. We we lost that battle. Now that we've lost that battle, that this is the new framework. Why can't council participate? In, in this so-called market. Let's go in the market because our service is a better quality service. Our service is much more trusted than, than the private services. People want to stay with council services. They don't want to be pushed off council services into... You hit the audio again. <laughs> People don't want to be pushed off council services and end up with our private, private providers. So what we did and we were successful you know, with the change, with the election that occurred last year, we're able to put in our council plan that Darabin Council becomes a registered aged care package provider, which means that council can now, or it's going through the process, will then be able to compete with the others and say, if you need an aged care package and you've been given an aged care package, here we are as council. You can stay with us. We'll continue to provide you the service, wow. things like mm. that. And, um, and and I know that the ASU, the, the union... You've hit the thing again. ASU, the union that covers aged care workers, they're very keen in, 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 um, in informing councillors about this and that they inform themselves because, and not just to rely um, on the information that they get from, uh, you know, from their administrations and from their bureaucrats but to actually inform themselves about this issue. Another question I wanted to ask both of you is um, how you keep your profile up, how you build a base in the community and how you boost community power and community organisations. Ari explained that key reason to win the bin campaign was the fact that the community were fired up and organised. It's the same, obviously, with the Preston Market. What Gaetano was saying, he couldn't do it on his own. If it was just Gaetano that gave you shit about the Preston Market, you'd, you know, nothing would happen. Um, in my area, we've got like community groups coming out of every orifice or everywhere. And now they've sort of <laughs> semi-united into a Yarra Residence Coalition, um, which, which helps, you know, I mean, the, the, they're not all one big happy family. Some lean towards more sort of planning heritage issues, some more on bins and a bit more militant, I could say, and maybe some are a little bit softer, but they work together. And what I find is that I get rung up every day, like five, six, seven, eight calls a day from punters with all different types of things. And unless it's just like a small issue, like, oh, my bin wasn't picked up or whatever it might be, um, if it's a genuine issue that could turn into a campaign, I encourage them to try and get a petition amongst their friends mm -hmm. to have a Zoom meeting with me to set up, even if it's a short-term sort of action group, um, I'll go to the my contacts in this Herald Sun or The Age and try and hook them up with a resident to do a story on it. And then I'll bring them to the council um, and lobby the council. But by the time I bring it to the council, they've already done that work. So they've wedged the other councillors. And sometimes I get them to go <laughs> higher to the state member who's Labour, Richard Wynn, the Minister of Planning, or the federal member who's Green, Adam Banth, the leader of the Greens. It's her only seat in the federal parliament. Um, so there's a little sort of a pro forma way I do it. And in terms of my own profile, I bring out a, um, a newsletter every six months, which I letterbox to everybody. And also um, I have weekly street meetings in different parts of my ward where I just letterbox a particular part of Collingwood or Abbotsford, wherever it might be. And they just stand on the street corner and punters come along. And um, I find that's really useful because it gives me a forensic knowledge of, trust me, some of the issues are super friggin' boring. 
um, that people raise. Like, <laughs> light bulb here hasn't worked since 2017 or whatever. And I bore my kids senseless when I'm driving down. Oh, have you noticed that light bulb? So, but it gives you that that background information. But you know, my 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 ex-wife once said to me, you know what, you try to solve everyone's problems. Most people just want to be heard. You know, just you know, the fact that you know, that I stand at the end of their street corner, maybe three or four times over the course of a year in every part of my ward, I'll hit every area. Um, people will say to me, ah, oh, that jolly guy, I'm not going to vote. For, you know, I wasn't going to vote for him. He's a freaking socialist. I don't like, it's all bullshit. However, no one else stood on my street corner on a Sunday afternoon. So I'll give him a two. I'm a liberal. I'm a, I'm a blue, strong liberal or whatever. Um, or sometimes people, I mean, the people who vote for me who would never want me running the country like as a socialist, they, they drop dead, they have a stroke, but they, so I, I just think that, you know, for those listening in terms of how do you build a base and how do you support communities to have the type of organizations that we see around the Preston market, the bins in, in, um, in Hobson's Bay and the campaigns that we have in Yarra, this, it's, it's not like rocket science. It's, you know, it's just building it up and building people's confidence a step at a time. I, I go out of my way to, um, you know, visit as many groups and clubs as possible. And then, and also, um, you know, to get involved in local issues, like say if there's something, if I see, if I hear rumblings uh, about a particular issue, I try to get involved um, and, um, you know, partake in some of their meetings and, and, and just to be sort of there in terms of, you know, a lot of times they want to, people want to know what the process is, how they can, how they can put pressure, what they need to do and things like that. And, 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 and to do that sort of stuff. Um, the other thing too that I think really works really well, and you, 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 you know, and I really admire a lot of the stuff that you just said there, Stephen, about you know standing on corners and and putting out um, material and stuff like that. One of the things that I find that's really effective is that when I get a call from a um, from a resident, you immediately try to answer the call and yeah. you pay respect to that call, even if even if the call is like you said the most mundane thing about a, a street light. Or a pothole, because what I found is that with, with you know many of the people that I deal with, is that if you fix up their pothole, you build up political capital, uh -huh. because then on the harder you know on those sort of more controversial issues, whether it's you know change the date in relation to January twenty six, or or if it's about refugees, or just recently you know I put forward a motion about Palestine. Right. And people say, well, you know, I sort of I don't agree with that councillor, but I know that when I call him. Right, he's on the phone. I don't have to go through three or four people to get onto him, and uh, and he makes sure that you know he does what he can to to get the issue addressed. Even if you fix the issue or you don't fix the issue, the fact mm -hmm. that you're listening and you're taking you've had a crack, yeah. exactly. And, and, exactly. I, and, I learned, and, I, and I learned this in the first in the first six months. I never forget this. A guy called me. It was a very simple issue, and for some reason I didn't call him back. It took ten days for me to call him back big error and when I called him back even though we we're able to fix up his issue I, I knew that this person would never speak to me again he respect you know and 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 I and I made a big error there and, and, and that was a really big lesson for me you you've got to listen to people sometimes you may not agree with them but you've got to be willing to put your face out there look I've gone to street meetings where I know I was going to go and meet an angry bunch of people I know that I know I went there and after the after the first 10 minutes of screaming and shouting, then they respect that you're there. That's the sort of stuff that they would say to you. You know what I mean? And, and so you just build up that trust, you know, with the community and um, and that they know that they can listen to you and that and that they know that you will actually represent their views and and um, and give them the time of day. Mm -hmm. Daria, what's been your experience with calls and responding? I mean, have you you have you sort of was it is, is the workload more than you thought it was going to be? It's it's definitely a lot more than I thought it would be. But like like both of you have pretty much said, you need to make yourself available. Um, and I knew that you know I was able to make a difference with that first phone call that I received. So the the person who rang me, as soon as I answered it, he was actually shocked yes. that the counsellor answered that phone call. Um, and he said, you know, in, in the past few years, he's tried contacting councillors and never had anyone respond to him. Um, and, yeah, like uh, uh, that sort of, you know, went to, it told me that, um, you know, people didn't really have faith in, I guess, council or have lost respect for council in many ways. And 
you know, that I was able to step in and, and change that. And I mean, you know, we had a situation today that I can talk to. So, you know, living in a hotspot area, um, a number of sites have been sort of triggered off as tier one and tier two sites. We've had this issue that's made its way onto Channel 7 News about um, a local pathology centre um, that does COVID testing. And, and once they're here, with, um, a lot of people lining up to get COVID tests, they line up in a main shopping strip pretty much past all these stores. So you can imagine people lining up who potentially have COVID symptoms, could even be a COVID case, lined up in a street that people are walking past to go grab their coffee, lined up past, you know, um, shops that people are entering to grab their, their groceries and so on. It's a, it's a big community risk. And, you know, it was on the Channel 7 News, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, and I received a phone call from local trader um, in the community basically saying, look, you know, they're at it again. These lineups are here again. Um, so I actually went down the street to take a look and there were police officers there. So like police officers in, in a different area of, um, in that sort of the same street, um, where I met a trader and I said, look, I'm, I'm going to walk up to these cops and ask them if they can do something. Um, and I, I did, I walked up to them and said, Hey, look, you know, this is the situation. Can you walk up to them and just tell them? To, to move the line into the opposite direction that heads toward the train station instead of the local shops um, until, you know, the Department of Health come in to, to sort this out. And the cops actually said no, which sort of shocked me because, you know, take it back a couple of days, we had, I, I got phone calls from residents who were basically complaining that they were just sitting on the beach and the police were there asking them to move along and not linger because that goes against the rules. They should be moving as part of their two-hour exercise and not just sort of hanging out on the beach. Um, so it sort of surprised me that the police didn't want to do this, but having the traders there sort of see me willing to take a stand, approach the cops and just ask them, I think, you know, that's that's a quick win too. Uh, absolutely spot on. Um, I still, can, I just, add, can I just add something in there? Yeah, yeah, because I just don't want people to get confused You've hit the, the audio thing. The audio, yeah, audio. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, I just don't want people to be confused that, um, you know, that we're just, you know, that we, we just accept what people, you know, want to say or, or we're just there to um, uh, be populist because I, I, make this yeah. I make this important distinction. I'm not a populist. I don't believe it. You've hit the thing again, uh, Gaetana. <laughs> Yeah, we've got to make an important distinction about, um, you know, because sometimes the approaches that we take sometimes can be criticised as being populist approaches, you know. You get that accusation. Oh, you just want to do what people say. No, far from yeah. it. Far from it. You've got to pay respect to people. Mm. You've got to pay respect to people. And even, if, and even if you have a different opinion, you've got to give people the time of day. And, um, and there's nothing wrong like um, what, you, what you did, Daria. Daria. If there is, if there's nothing wrong in accepting a, a popular decision, you know, if it has certain, you know, reasoning to it, an understanding about it, and things like that, that's not being a populist. Because I find that some, um, you know, uh, some people, you know, even some progressive people, so say, oh, you know, you, you're just trying to be a, a populist. You're just trying isn't, to accept. Isn't that. isn't the pop isn't representing the popular decision? part of representing the community i mean if that's what the community want it would be the popular decision yeah but there's that too Daria. but i know for example when i talk about refugees or when i talk about for uh, uh, aboriginal issues um I, i've got no problem I, I just i just state what what i think uh, what i believe in that's not necessarily popular i know that it's not popular in certain parts mm -hmm. of my community right and i've got no you know it's not that you shy away from those issues but it, but if people have got a different view, at least you at least they know that that you're prepared to listen to their views uh -huh. and as best as possible and try to represent their views. I, I think it also reflects the, the era of um, social media politics, where you say something and you either get all those likes and those dopamine sort of fix out of it, and but then you've got other people that will just take you down in the cruelest way. That if anyone said that to you on the street, I swear to God, you'd slap them, you know. I, I, but they pick, and 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 the, the art of like listening, discussing, and debating has gone out the friggin' window. Yeah. So to come back to what Gaetano said and and um, you know uh, Darius' experience, if you don't listen to people, 
who disagree with you, you're never going to, they're going to never give you an opportunity to put an alternative point of view. So when somebody yeah. comes up to me and says, oh, I don't want to get a vaccine because it's got, I'm going to be impotent or I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. If I just start laughing at them or, or yeah. swearing at them or telling them to, you know, whatever, that's the end of the conversation. They're going to walk away with their view. You, you have to listen. You have to let them get it off their chest and, and you know, start um, then getting get, get a little opportunity to put an alternative point of view. I think nowadays people don't listen. Um, a lot of people now think politics is just screaming at each other on social media. So the art of listening, of discussion, of debate is lost. Um, and to convince another person, if that's what you want to do, and truly the only way to, to be more powerful for your ideas or whoever, whatever it might be, is to convince more and more people. It's to actually have respect for people who don't, you don't agree with mm -hmm. and then go through that dialectic of discussion. And if you're not used to that, if you just like scream and shout at people who don't agree with you, you're never going to get anywhere. You're just going to live in your little bubble, whether that's in the inner city or wherever else that, that might be. Um, Daria, you wanted to add something to that from some experience yeah, yeah. you had in your area. No, exactly. So you've said it really well. I think a lot of people sort of jump on that. You know, it's either black or it's white type issue. So you're either on either side of the spectrum. And if you pick a side, you end up getting criticised. And I think, you know, a lot of people um, can't put themselves in somebody, somebody else's shoes. So when the state government, for example, um, shut down playgrounds, I took a stand and said, you know, I, I disagree with that. And I think that there's a need based on the low risk and based on the fact that they hadn't even managed to link a case to playgrounds, that um, playgrounds should not be closed. And I copped some backlash. And it, it's always the same people, though, Stephen, who criticise. I find on social media it's the exact same names, the exact same people who take a dig. Um, and, you know, in that time, I remember walking down the street, childcare centres were also closed to people. I remember walking down the street, walking past the playground, um, and there was a guy with a toddler playing on the swings, playing on the slide, and a couple walked past and they were clearly pissed off and they're like, oh, look at this guy, you know, breaking the rules. Um, we're going to dob him in. They grab their phone out and, you know, I happen to be there to say, look, just calm down. Let me let me speak to him. I mean, you know, it's not like he's robbing a bank or something, like just, just calm down. Um, so I went over to speak to him and he was a bit nervous when I approached. Um, and I said, look, you know, I, I don't care if you're playing on the swing. I'm not going to dob you in. It's, it's none of my business. But I just want to let you know that there are people who will potentially report you and I don't want that to happen. Um, and, you know, he kind of explained a little bit about what was happening in his life and how he lost his job and he was struggling and he just needed that moment to, to put a smile on his, his little boy's face. Um, and, you know, these are, these, these are real people. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, some of these decisions and some of the stuff that you see on, on social media doesn't, doesn't acknowledge that. People just willing to jump and criticise from their own, own point of view and their own perspective without walking, I guess, walking a day in somebody else's shoes. I wanted to talk to both of you about the Greens. Um, we've all got <laughs> Greens on our council and since the early 2000s, since 2001 when Karim Sekron won a council by-election in the city of Yarra, first Green councillor in Australia. Um, since then, they've grown as a presence on inner city councils in Sydney and in, uh, in Melbourne and in some other parts of Australia as well. Um, and, um, and often at the expense of the Labour Party, um, who in my council, which used to be the heartland of the ALP, there's literally no Labour councillors in the city of Yarra at the moment. Mm -hmm. But... It's sort of like a weird sort of thing, because in words, Adam Band, for example, if you go to his social media, his political campaigning, it's very, very left wing. He's using the language of Jeremy Corbyn in England and Bernie Sanders back in the day in the USA. And he's talking of quite left wing issues. But at a local level, often and not not every one of them, but often when they've been in power, um, well, first of all, that they've been elected usually in the richer areas, like normally left wing parties historically, internationally are elected in poorer areas and richer areas elect sort of more right-wing parties. That's usually how it works, but it's sort of the opposite with the Greens. Um, and also sometimes the policies that they've implemented have been quite neoliberal and quite different than what their party is calling for at a national level. And I just, it's sort of, it's an, it's an unusual thing. I know in my council, we've got five Greens now, so it's a real issue. It's not just some type of political 
ideological abstract issue. It's a real genuine um, issue on the ground. And I think it's been really confusing for, for residents um, to see the difference between what, say, Ban's saying on the one hand and what their local Green councillor is saying on the other. So, Gaetano, you, you've, had, you've got Greens, I take it, on your council and have had for some time. I mean, what's been your experience? Of, do you think that's a bit harsh or, I mean, what I just said, or what, what's been your experience with the Greens over the years? Yeah, look, I think the Darabin Council has going has gone through some of the stuff that you just said, um, Stephen. Um, you know, Labor, former Labor heartlands have now become um, dominated by by Green councillors. Um, Green councillors have often used the um, the council as it's a it's a platform for um, state politics and, and federal politics, and and that's been there's nothing new in that. Labor's done that too. Lots of people that come through council then end up as MPs. They get their numbers, get pre-selected and, and things like that. But um, look, it, it, my experience with the Greens has been um, uh, in the past, I had a, a much more positive relationship with them. And, um, but of, of recent time, I've, I've grown a bit more um, cautious and sceptical of some of the positions that they take. And, and the way to explain it is that... Um, I, I just find that uh, often all the all the right language is used, you know, all in nice inclusive language. They tick all the boxes, um, and but when it comes to actually the substance of issues, um, I, I think sometimes they they're really detached from that. And I know that within the Greens, even though they don't want to admit this, there are various various currents in the Greens, and. Um, you know, there's what, what I call the, the very bureaucratic types in the Greens that just, uh, like you said, Stephen, um, you know, some of them are just outright you know, neo, neoliberals. You know, they've got no, no sense of, you know, whether it's um, publicly run or, 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 or it's um, privately run. They've got no, you know, they're sort of in, in, indifferent on, on, on some of those issues. And, and sometimes I find that, uh, like, some of them, not all of them, you know, some of them are... I'm, I know quite well and I've got a lot of respect for, but some of them, for example, um, like they may be talking about issues that affect, you know, something that I've got a strong affinity to, say, for example, some ethnic issues, you know, and, you know, they'll have all the right language, you know, all the right things, but, um, but many of them will not even feel comfortable talking to somebody whose first language is not English because oh. many of them are from uh, middle class uh, professional backgrounds. That don't have that affinity or that association uh, with you know with with ordinary um, um, common people, and 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 that makes it really awkward. And 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 to me, with some of them, they have very much what I call this corporatist attitude, you know, like functionary approach to things rather than an approach which is really um, you know rooted in the community and, and truly democratic and truly and truly representative of of the various faces of, of the city. And I, I'll just finish on this note, like, like I noticed, for example, um, that you know, just broadly speaking, not just in my house, but just broadly speaking, some of the um, uh, Green Party members, I find have real difficulty speaking to people of diverse, with, with, from, from diverse backgrounds. There's no, they don't have any connection points with them. It's like as if, um, that these people don't really have anything to contribute. And, and I find sometimes that those sort of attitudes, you know, can be elitist and, um, and arrogant, you know, in terms of not acknowledging uh, people's life experiences. What, what's your, your, being, your experience at Hobson's Bay, Daria? You've got um, so one green there. So we've, we've got one green and, you know, obviously I'll, I'll just stick to facts and, and not make anything personal um, here. But if we're looking at something like um, the garbage bin issue, so, you know, that was implemented to reduce landfill volume. Um, but our Greens mayor has admitted in public meetings that he has actually upsized his garbage bin. Um, so he upsized from a 120-litre bin being collected uh, fortnightly to a 240-litre bin being collected uh, fortnightly. Um, and, you know, that comes at a cost. So if you can afford to pay $90 a year, you can basically create more landfill. And, and that, to me, um, from a principal perspective of implementing a system that's, that's defined as green to reduce landfill, yet being able to 
pay for a bigger bin to create the same amount of landfill. It just doesn't really make sense. Um, so I found that a little bit hypocritical. I guess, like, I find personally that the Greens are, they come across as quite undemocratic um, because they are upper middle class professionals. They are the technocrats. They actually think the technocrats can run the council better if it can only just not have the meddling by ordinary people. So it's almost like an air of moral superiority they have. So for example, I'll give you one example. So, you know, the council that I'm in, that they're, they're bringing in a lot of bike lanes, which is fantastic. We all want to get people cycling for public health reasons and also for environmental reasons. But even a good idea implemented undemocratically or without community input, is never going to work as well as it could, could work. Mm-hmm. You know, Ross Beer used to say, um, people hate missionaries with bayonets, you know? So um, there's been time and time again where bike lanes have been introduced without first talking to local businesses, without first talking to local residents, and it's just been really badly designed, and it's needed a community fight back to get that to to uh, to happen. Um, you know, the inability of the Greens to see the need for social housing at Collingwood Town Hall to, to give away, to take to say no to like free money, essentially from the state government, to have a project that would have had 50% low cost housing, the highest, it would have been the highest in Australian history. The fact that they try to screw over sports clubs by jacking up their fees, and they had to retreat in the wave of a massive campaign by the community sports clubs, over 50 clubs in Yarra, shows a level of out of touchiness, if there was such a word, that it's actually breathtaking. The Labour Party are a different kettle of fish. Like whatever you think about the Labour Party, they, um, they're, they're, they're much more, I think, in tune with what ordinary people are, uh, are thinking and are, and are easier to pressure. Um, but the Greens just seem to have this wall around them of moral superiority and total, be totally immune to community pressure unless it's overwhelming like it was with the sports clubs. Just at a broader level, just in relation to the Greens, um, what I find is often uh, missing, not just at the council level, but also in state and federal um, stuff, is that uh, they often lack a socioeconomic lens to, to what, they're, what they're proposing. They, they tend to ignore, if you like, in old speak, it's, you know, a class lens, you know, in relation to um, addressing policies. And we see this sometimes unravel itself in relation to, um, you know, the way uh, policy positions are put forward. And it's not taken into account, you know, whether people have the capacity to actually uh, economically participate in, oh. in, in in those things. And, 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 and you know, you know, they may be, you know, that may be the objective of, of what we, you know, what, you know, what we want to go into, but uh, you've got to take people for where they are at now, you know, mm. both um, economically and also in terms of what their understanding of, of various issues are. And, um, and you just can't impose like a, a supposedly, um, you know, um, a sense of, you know, what's right and, and what should be done and, and things like that. Uh, you know, that just doesn't fit with me. And it doesn't fit with my my own life experience of, you know, being around, you know, working class people and people from migrant backgrounds, you know. You know, it, it's arrogant to say, to, you know, to, to certain um, sections of our community, this is this is what's good for you. You know, this yeah. is what you want to do. Yeah. You know, and, can, and just can I add something little, to that? A little pip on this. You know, I just find it amazing how... Now, you know, we all talk about community gardens, yep, and it's a great thing. But I tell you what, I mean, you know, the Wogs in Reservoir and Northcote in the past, they all had gardens in the back of their backyards. <laughs> and now because it's been made into a project of a community garden, you know, and now it's like as if, you know, it's just got invented yesterday. People have been it's doing this for the last, Yeah, people have been doing this for the last 70 years, mm-hmm. you know, making their own stuff and doing all their own things. And, um, and, and that sort of stuff has not been acknowledged, you know. It, 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 there's no proper recognition for, for where that stuff is and where it comes from. And that really irks me, you know, in terms of, you know, if you like the arrogance sometimes that's associated with, um, you know, some of the broader environmental and, and green issues. Daria, yeah. you wanted to add something? So, you know, again, this, this, it's not related to, um, you know, my counsellor in, in, in particular or anything like that. 
um, just more within the community. But um, it, it's it's like feedback and comments that you see online with, um, you know, mums who choose, as an example, to use disposable nappies. Um, you see people who, you know, are linked to the Greens Party within the local community making comments um, that call them polluters and how they should revisit their choices and the impact to the environment that they're making and just adding another layer of shame to a, a new mum who's probably, you know, going through all the, the difficult, a, 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 like, changes in life of becoming a, a first-time mum, for example. Um, they're adding this new la layer of shame um, for using disposable nappies and contributing to landfill volumes and they basically tell you that, you know, you're a horrible person, you start need to start using cloth nappies. Um, and like you said, there's just no, no judgment or, or no understanding of what that person might be going through or what their personal needs are um, at that time. It just seems to be them telling you that you have to do something regardless of that. It's like kicking down, not kicking up. Um, yeah. So it's a lot easier to say, to have a crack at the tradie who's got a car, um, who has to drive from Altona to Dandenong to get to work every morning at seven o'clock in the morning, or you should be using a tram or cycling, um, or pick on the, on the mum who's using disposable nappies rather than, um, if you want to talk about climate change in the inner city, as I said earlier on in the interview, it's from stationary energy. It's the developers who are embedding carbon fuel, um, uh, carbon fuel derived, uh, fuel, um, car carbon derived energy in the new developments that are responsible for over 80% of the emissions. But mm -hmm. they don't want to take on the big business. It's a lot easier just to take on individuals. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's really, really frustrating. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that um, if there was an election tomorrow in Yarra, I, there's no way the Greens would get five seats. I think people are beginning to see through them. Um, and, um, and again, as you said, uh, Daria, this is not a personal thing. There's none of, none of, none of the five Greens in Yarra I dislike. I think they're all nice people. None of them, um, you know, all the councils are nice people. That's not what it's about. It's about a policy position and an, an approach to politics that I think just people can just pick it up that they're being looked down on and they don't like it, you know. Um, well, that's been my experience anyway. Um, Stephen, you're spot on. It's not a personal issue, you know, and, and that it's not about... Um, um, it's not against any individual. You're right. It's, it's, it's more of a, a, a systemic thing. And I'll just give you one little fact that would really surprise me. In our city, in the northern part of our city, which is a much more working class city, a much more working class uh, background compared to the southern part of our city, the carbon footprint of the north is way less than the carbon footprint of the <laughs> south. So, yeah, and, and it's obvious. I live in the south of the city, but I represent the north because I've got greater affinity. Well, obviously, because in the south of the city, you know, we, we take where we could, we take our overseas trips, you know, we go away and you see all the nice new cars, you know, people constantly changing their, their cars and, and things like that. And then what gets criticised, you know, is the, um, you know, is the old Italian, you know, watering their concrete, you know, and, and thinking, <laughs> well, that's bad, but wait a minute, put that, you know, uh, because, you know, in our city, the people up in the, in the northern part of our city, they're much more conscious in relation to their energy use and, and much more thrifty and things like that. But those sort of things are not, not acknowledged. They're not recognised, you know, it's sort of um, looked over. Yeah. One of the, one of the ways uh, that this sort of debate, leaving just as the Greens aside for a side, but that type of politics um, has expressed itself in Yarra has been over the drug issue in North Richmond. Um, Victoria Street, Lanark Street, North Richmond is pretty much the centre of the, the ice and the heroin industry in this city. And I fought really, really hard back from the 1990s at, at organised rallies with the Socialist Party back in the day for, um, for a supervised injecting facility, and we got one in the end. But where we were told it was going to be five or six of them for the whole of Melbourne, there's only one in Melbourne, and it's in North Richmond. So if you want to use it and you take heroin or you take ice, you've got to go to North Richmond. And also because the police have got a sort of, um, they got a bit softer around the supervised injecting facility because that's probably part of the deal. There's a lot of dealers, drug dealers in that area. Uh, and so people who live in that area, because this is the only supervised injecting facility in the world that's been put next to a primary school, next to a public mm. housing estate, next to residents. It's not like the one in King's Cross or in other parts of the world. 
So um, I, you know, I, I think it should have been on Victoria Street, right where the where the buying buying it, but they didn't want to take on the traders. So the point I'm making is that lots of ordinary people who live around that area are saying, you know, there's there's needles on our street, there's drug use on our street, it's getting worse, and people on the progressive side of politics who support, like I do, you know, a more um, health approach to drugs, just laugh at those people and say, oh, we'll just move house. What are you talking about? You know. You're all bloody nimbies, and, and they, they, they're just not listening to the fact that it's absolutely bedlam in that area if you're a normal resident. And But that doesn't mean the residents are a bunch of rednecks. I mean, I know one lady that lives right close to the supervised injecting facility who wants it moved, but every single morning she comes out into her front garden and gives water to the drug users so they have fresh water for their fits. Do you know what I mean? So it's like a mixed consciousness. The people that have been attacked for being like Trump bite rednecks for wanting the supervised injective facility moved are actually got a better relationship with the drug dealers and drug users than these hoity toity types, you know? Um, and the residents just hate them, like the Greens, the, the Reason Party, Fiona Patton, and all these people who basically are quite happy for the drug industry to be um, uh, trapped in North Richmond so it doesn't go to their areas in Turak or, or somewhere else for that matter. So, um, and, it, and what the danger of it is that just people then look at the left and they just go, well, if the Reason Party, if the Green Party, if the Labour Party don't care about us, maybe we've got to go to the Liberals. And what the Liberals have done very cleverly is their health spokesperson. She's gone around there. They've done petitioning in the most working class part of Yarra, the biggest public housing estate literally in the Southern Hemisphere. They've got Liberals doing petitions and coming to all the meetings, even the ones that I organise. And what I really fear, and this is why I wanted you two on the show, is that you got this balkanization of politics in America where people don't talk to each other. One lot watch CNN and read the Washington Post and vote Democrat. One lot watch Fox and uh, have their own separate, you know, and obviously vote Republican, love Trump or whatever. And there's, there's no dialogue. There's literally no dialogue. And I think what you've done, Daria, and what you've done, Gaetan, and, and Jesus, no one's saying the three of us agree on all issues. We're not in the same party. We're not in any party. But we all sort of straddle both. Do you know what I mean? We'd have people voting for both of you two who would, if they were in America, would probably vote for Trump. And people who vote for you two, if they're in America, would have gone for Biden or even Bernie Sanders. Do you know what I mean? You, you've sort of straddled it. And I think that's really, really exciting and really needs to be nurtured because it's not happening. It's not happening enough. And I, and I really worry about this balkanization taking place. Um, which is different than class polarization, by the way. It's, it's a very dangerous thing um, because on the social issues, working class people can be really pushed to the right and get in bed with a whole bunch of very dodgy people who actually don't have their best interests at heart. And yeah, anyway, I just went on a bit of a rave there, but it, I just think it just really, really pisses me off when the punters in North Richmond get attacked for not caring, not, you know, they know more about the drug industry than half of these yuppies they give mm -hmm. them a, half, a hard time, you know what I mean? So, but that's, you've um, just highlighted another another issue. It's it's all about listening, and I think this is why, regardless of political parties, um, you know, from a council and councillor perspective, it's about listening to people within the in your community and actually going in for, to bat for them. I mean, you can't put your, you know, if you're a Greens member and and these are your, you know, party politics, you shouldn't be applying those when it comes down to local council. Yeah, you know, I totally agree with that. Gaetano, do you have a situation where um, it's a divide? Like you talked before about the Bell Street, Berlin Wall, north and south of the city of Darabin, but you, you, you would have people in both north and south. I mean, you're considered like me. You come from a left-wing tradition. You know, there would be people who would be very left-wing who would be very much more comfortable living in the south of Darabin and north of Darabin who drink $5 cafe latte, soy lattes, who would be really proud to say that they vote for you. But you've also got huge support in, you know, working class northern suburbs. So do you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, do, do you see that there's a sort of a division that's arising? And how do you, if, if that is the case, how do you think we can get, we can work to try and not see that happen? Yeah, look, I think you've hit on a, on a really important um, issue there, um, Stephen. And, um, and I've often thought about this, you know, in terms of, you um, you know, like you're saying, the, the balkanization of politics, it's either you're considered to be progressive or you could you consider to be, you know, right wing. And, um, and what I found, you know, just, you know, in my own little world, you know, in terms of Darabin and talking to people is that, is that 
what the right has done, and if you look at, uh, I'm going to generalise here in terms of the Bush and uh, so in terms of Trump, is that what the right has done is that th th there's been a bit of a vacuum uh, created. It's in the sense that um, that people that were traditionally, if you like, um, more sort of, you know, that would vote Labor, more sort of working class and things like that, because I think they've been, in a way, let down by the, um, you know, if you want to call them the more elite, the, the more, um, so, so people out of, you know, it's almost out of protest, you know what I mean? Go then towards somebody or to others that then have more sort of right-wing type views and get attracted to that. And I think that's because of the absence of um, uh, people being present in politics and particularly at the local level, willing and picking up on what Dario said, willing to listen to these people, right? Willing to actually, you know, deeply listen to them, and because I don't think that, generally speaking, that people um, go to the right because they are naturally sort of of a right wing sort of perspective. No, it's more out of a protest. And I think, and um, being present and being there and providing an opportunity for their voices to be channeled, and also providing an opportunity of looking at things and looking at other possible options and and ways of doing things then gives people a, a, an alternative of either, you know, the so-called progressives or the so-called, you know, right-wing um, types. And, and I think that that space in the middle, there's a, there's a vacuum. And, 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 and in local government, I think that's where we need to play a role. And, and more people need to play that role of actually, um, you know, truly representing and truly listening to people so that they don't get pulled by these extremist views. Yeah, because Daria, just, just following up from what Gaetano said, I mean, Gaetano and I both come from like a socialist, a working class, a left-wing political tradition. We're now both independent left-wing councillors. I think I'd comfortably call Gaetano that. I, I describe myself as a socialist councillor. I'm not in any mm -hmm. socialist organisation. Mm -hmm. um, you come from a very, very different background. You're a chartered accountant. Um, yeah. And it really pisses me off, by the way, just to, to jump a bit, is that some people who oppose you on... On um, at Hobson's Bay, try to categorize you as some type of female Donald Trump in the yeah. Western suburbs. You know what I mean? Yeah. And is that just a way of guaranteed pushing people in that direction? Why would you do that? I mean, it's but, crazy. But, see, it's, okay, but I feel I think, much more. I mean, you've won com from the community point of view. You've done something that the left haven't done. The Greens or the Labour. Well, I mean, the Labour Party backed you on the bins, but you know what I mean. You you led that. So it's, it's it, way it's, more complicated than just putting you in that, oh, she's from the right, she's an ex chartered accountant sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, but it's, you know it I mean? is interesting that you say that, though, because the in order to get the, the BIN um, motion amendment up, it needed to be seconded. And the, the councillor who seconded that was the Labor councillor. Um, and it's interesting to, to see that, you know, people who, who are happy to criticise me are, in, are embedded within the Labor Party. And they're making the assumptions that, you know, I'm, I'm some sort of right wing um, person and they're happy to criticise me for putting the amendment forward, but they won't acknowledge his involvement in it. So, I mean, I'd argue that they're politicking, really. Um, and, you know, having said that, being lumped in, in, you know, to one sort of linked to one sort of party on the um, opposing side, I put forward a, an amendment in a motion, sorry, in February this year which asked council to, um, to ban the use of single-use plastics. And I had people attacking me and calling me some sort of left-wing greenie at that time. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to put a label on somebody based on what your own personal beliefs are as opposed to actually listening to the reason why they put, you know, why they've enacted or done something or gone down a certain path. We also pushed through the budget, um, me and, you know, a couple of other councillors as well. Um, a rebate for uh, what's it called? A rebate for reusable nappies, and yeah, that's something that would be deemed, I guess, green greens party based on you know what, what we've done and, and the fact that that you know reduces landfill volumes as well. Um, so I mean, you know, I I do things that I think are in the best interest of the community, regardless of politics. Um, but yeah, no matter what you do, you're going to be labelled as something based on the decision that you make, and you know, it is what it is. Um, thanks, Daria. Just, just one last question um, to you, Gaetano. Um, sometimes, especially in the Herald Sun, people like you and me have been criticised for, and councils in the inner city in general, 
for taking on issues that clearly are not council issues. For example, in your council, the nuclear free Darabin, um, I think you, um, you had, there was another thing, the Palestine thing, I, I raised that and got into all in the trouble with that one, I'll tell you, in the city of Yarra, I won't even go down that road. But um, about three years ago, we were the first council to, um, the indigenous, um, what was then called the Aboriginal Advisory Group, came to the council at, at a public council meeting and said, can we uh, change Australia Day, call it Invasion Day and support us and have it our own. We don't want to stop people in, in uh, celebrating Australia Day in a traditional way if that's what they want to do, but we want an opportunity also parallel with that to have smoking ceremonies and reflect for us it's not a it's not a day of celebration it's a day of of of, of something totally different um so i just want to ask you because you are rooted in the community you do no no one can say that you don't fight for the bread and butter issues of darabin residents in your in your ward in your municipality however you have at times like i have raised bigger issues why why have you done that why do you think that's important do you think that that just loses you votes that that is like, um, what's the point of it? Or do you think it's an important thing? Well, clearly you do think it's an important thing, but can you just give me some of your thinking behind that? Say for the nuclear free Darwin, because you were then blasted and laughed at by the Herald Sun about that, even last week. Yeah, no, look, um, like, you, like you, Stephen, um, I've never shied away from those, uh, from those issues. And I think it's important that those issues are raised. And why I think it's important is that, um, you know, we are a tier of government. Let's not forget that. There are three tiers of government in Australia. There's local government, state government, and federal government. And state government polit uh, politicians, they could talk about anything that they want. No one says to them, oh, you know, you're, talk you're talking about a federal matter, which should be a, a state matter. And federal politicians could talk about federal matters, but also they can delve down and, um, and talk about local matters, you know? And, um, and I think, um, you know, there's the old saying that where the you know, we're the closest um, uh, tier of government uh, to the people. And I think that we should be able to express views that are in our community about uh, bigger issues. And, um, and and why I do that and why I think that's important, Stephen, because particularly in a community like Darabin, like, like, for example, recently I moved a motion about Afghanistan and about the, the refugees um, that the where the Australian government sold out some of the... Um, um, you know, some of the refugees here already in Australia, there's 4,300 of them where they're not, they aren't being given temporary visas. And why we do that, why I do that is that because we have many members in our community that come from a multicultural background and, and these issues affect them. Like if it's issues about um, um, Islamophobia and the council taking a strong position to, to represent and defend and people from different, from different faiths, we need to take a position on that because people need to feel a sense of solidarity that their local council and their local community is actually looking out for them in, and looking out for the issues which, which indirectly have consequences for them. And so that's why I think it's important that we take issues on that. And, and also, if, if, if you look at the environmental issue, it's nothing new about that. Now, the Northgate Council, before it became the Darabin Council, was a nuclear-free zone back in the late 70s and early 80s. And why that's important? If you think of in terms of uh, uh, nuclear armaments, you know, councils invest money in banks and financial institutions like the tobacco industry and like other industries. And we divest from various um, um, uh, financial uh, investments because we don't think that they're ethically um, good. Why can't we apply the same sort of principle at a local level, right, to, um, to the possibility of um, companies that are invested in, in nuclear arms? Why can't the community at a local level, the community should at the local level, take positions on that? Open to be criticised on that, but, um, um, you know, we're entitled I think, I think to those the, sort of views. What, what the public say to me is that, like, it's a balance because if you're a councillor or a faction on the council that does nothing for the community, that you never answer the phone calls, you never answer the emails, you, you, you implement policies that nobody wants, you betray the election platform that you stood on, and then you come along and you start talking about the war in Afghanistan, people think you're full of shit. Do you know what I mean? So um, it's like, I like salt in my omelet, but if I put too much salt on it, I fuck up the omelet. So I just think that what I, the, the approach that I've taken is I've been quite cautious um, with taking those issues up because you know you're on, you're going to get like, blasted by sections of the media. So I, I make sure that it's balanced, that people will go, 
um, that you, you have to earn the right to exactly. raise those. I think it's the way I put it in the age. It's like, you know, you put a sticker on your car, you know, I, I shoot, therefore, and I vote, or whatever. It could be a right-wing sticker, left-wing sticker. And, and that's great. You know, you decorate your car, you tell the world what you think. But if you've got a kid in the back seat and you decorate the car with stickers, but you don't put petrol in the car, your kid is going to lamp blast you. Your kid's going, you're a stupid dad. You, you forgot to put petrol in the car. And you're sticking all these stickers on the car. And I think it's sort of like the same. Do you know what I mean? So, like, all, I'm all up for all these flags and raising broader issues, but it can't be at the expense of having services that are 21st century standards, you know what I mean? That we're, 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 we're doing all the things that we stand for that the three of us got elected to do. Um, I think that's that's what the problem is. People don't have a problem with somebody like you, Gaetano, raising that issue. Um, it's more about, I think, you know, again, like the Greens, for example, they were great at putting flags up at Yarra Council for all types of things. Some of them I didn't even understand, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, at the same time as they were trying to destroy the sports clubs in the city of Yarra. That's what pissed people off. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, anyway, I just think we need to be cautious about that. Yeah. Uh, but, but Stephen, we, we need to do both. And I'll give you another example, which just came to me as I, as you were speaking. You know, there have been, we've taken a very strong position on refugees. And in the past, where the refugee issue was some, something that was offshore, away from us, you know, it was easy to take a position on that. Then the refugee problem issue came right to our doorstep within 200 metres away from the, from the council hall uh, in, at the Mantra uh, Hotel. And they were housing there and um, detaining uh, nearly 60 um, refugees. Now, as a council that, you know, we've been you know, saying all these things about refugees and things like that, then we needed to take a strong position because they're now on our turf. And we did take a strong position about that sort of stuff. And we can't shy away from that because um, a lot of people indirectly are affected by by those issues. And so, and, and I really take your point. And uh, when you talk about the salt with the omelette, the, the notion that I use is that you've got to build your political capital. Right? That means you, you've you got to look after people, whether it's sporting clubs, potholes, you know, changing and uh, fixing up, um, you know, lights that don't fix you've got to do that stuff not not that you do them you know, in a cynical way you actually do them because they're important to people's um, um habitat and the way that they live um, but at the same time you know we could we could also walk a chew gum at the same time and why not do that if we can and we've got the energy to do that and and we've got the political will to do that oh definitely but i think that um a lot of people think that there's shortcuts to getting a big base in the community and to getting the support that Darius had in elections that you've or at, at the last election that you've had and I've had. And, you know, a lot of what we do is really fucking boring. And, you know, if you want to be a doctor, I, mean, I remember I used to go out with this woman, she's, um, she's, a, she's a lawyer and I'm, I went out with her for her final year of law. And I'm one of these frustrated lawyers. I, you know, I wanted to be Perry Mason and I nearly fell asleep. What tort law? You know, what she had to study at Melbourne Uni to be a lawyer would put most people to sleep. Um, and it's just hard yards. And but, but, but in politics, it's the same. I mean, 90 percent of what I do is pretty friggin mundane, you know, oh. and I'm sure it's the same for you, too. But um, but, I, you know, I suppose the point, the reason that I, somebody said to me this week when I told them that I was going to be into you, you two, they said, you three are winners, not wingers. And. You know, I felt like a bit of a big head when people said that to me, but it's actually a point that, you know, when you see something bad, Daria, like that guy in the playground, you didn't just go on Twitter and say, that little dog just brought his kid in the middle of a cup. You went over there and had that conversation. When the bins were being fucked up, you went in there and mobilised with the community and you won that. That's what you're doing with Preston Market. You're not just whinging about it on Twitter. Not that there's anything wrong. I mean, I'm a big whinger on Twitter. Don't get me wrong. But, like, it's... It's that type of politics that gets shit done. Do you know what I mean? There's a reason why my union, for example, is way stronger than the other unions. It's got a presence on every job. It's not perfect, but it actually goes out there and does shit. Do you know what I mean? And and I just think that maybe, um, you know, maybe we need to build on that in the future, you know, like talk more together and bring our com relevant and strong community groups in our different geographical areas to meet each other. You know, I have this vision that maybe in the future of getting all the different resident groups, even once a year, just to come together for half a day and just exchange experience, like how we fought in the Preston market or how we did the bins thing or how we, 
you know, campaign against the bin tax. We had a big win in 2017 in Yarra to stop in the bin tax, you know, but we don't talk to each other enough. Do you know what I mean? Um, I don't mean us three necessarily, just generally, but um, is there anything, I mean, I just really enjoyed listening to you too. I've learned so much, I've got to tell you, and um, hopefully the listeners have enjoyed it. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to add, Dario or Gaetano, before we knock it on the head? Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground there, um, um, Steve. Ho hopefully we haven't stepped on anyone's toes in, in, in the process. Um, this is the longest but, episode but, but I think we've it's ever important. had. I, I think these conversations, I just want to make this point. I, I think these conversations are really important because, yeah, you know, I, I think we're, you know, we've been around the local government space for a long time. And, I think um, you, that's you, you two have. <laughs> Yeah, but for you know, but Daria, for what you've already done, I mean, um, it, it seems like you've been a councillor for the last ten years in terms of yeah. all the things that you've been involved in, which is really, but it feels know, like ten years for her. It, it does. It feels like ten years. Yeah, but, but I suppose the point <laughs> I wanted to make was that, um, I, I think with in local government, um, it, it seemed to be like a sort of a, you know, a place that you don't do politics in, and and you, you just worry about, you know. Like, like you said, um, Steve, like 90%, 95% of what we do is just rubber stamping, you know, mundane things and, and stuff like that. And, and I think what's missing really in local government is that we tend to take the vision that's already established for local government. And, and that's really, it's not, it's not challenged enough, you know, from, say, from a progressive perspective. You know, you know for example... Why is the rating, you know, I just ask you, you know, pose a question, why is the rating system the way that it is? You know, should we be asking questions about, you know, why rates are raised in the way that they are raised? You know, and I come from a tax perspective, because you know, I've been an accountant, a tax accountant, you know, rates are, are, are a regressive sort of tax. You know, mm -hmm. they're not a progressive form of taxation. But no one asks any questions about that. I'm not, I don't know what the answer would be. But what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we, there isn't enough thought being given at a local government level about what local government ought to do and what it should look like and, and what it can do. It's just, it's like we're there as, even though we're elected people, it's like we're administrators and we just do what, you know, what without fundamentally challenging what the sector does. And I think more of that talk needs to be done. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Daria, um, we'll put up your contact details at the end. If you live in the western suburbs of Melbourne, you got anything wrong? You want to leave your husband? You want to leave your wife? You uh, you want some <laughs> relationship advice? Your bins aren't being picked up 24-7, you can ring Daria. Maybe not do that. but uh, And the same, <laughs> obviously, in the northern suburbs. Of Hannah, we'll put all your contact details. I really appreciate you two coming on. Um, as I said before, it's really, really enjoyed this episode, probably because like you two, I'm really passionate about local government and making it in, and getting politics in Australia to be a little bit more interesting and real than what they are at the present moment in time. Um, and I think you two are doing that in your areas and I'm having a crack in my area. So let's keep in contact. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks for coming on the episode.